open up with me to Acts chapter 7. And um, what we're going to be doing this morning is we're picking up right in the middle of Stephen's sermon. Um, that, that Stephen has been preaching this sermon to these uh, Jewish leaders about how uh, they have missed the coming of their Messiah, that they have uh, rejected uh, their Messiah. So um, the subject that we're going to be speaking about this morning is Israel's history of receiving and rejecting the Spirit, and more specifically about Moses. And the object is that we would trust in Christ as Lord and Savior, that we would trust in Christ as Lord and Savior. So um, if you would, please stand with me as we read uh, God's Word together. Uh, We're in Acts chapter 7, and we'll start right at verse 17. But when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose who did not know Joseph. This man dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies so that they might not live. At this time, Moses was born and was well-pleasing to God, and he was brought up in his father's house for three months. But when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds." Verse 23, now when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning that, um, that this book that uh, we are studying, the Bible, is your word, Lord. God, we thank you that your word, it's, it's living and it's active. Lord, so these aren't just um, irrelevant words to some other group of people, Lord. But God, since your word is living, it applies to us. And Father, we pray that this morning that by your spirit that you would speak to our hearts, Lord. That you would just um, breathe life into our lungs, Lord, give us spiritual eyes so that we could see the reality of who you are, Lord. And God, we just pray that you would speak to us, Lord. We want to hear you. We want to meet with you. We don't want this to be some religious exercise, God. We want to encounter you. We want to experience you this morning, Lord. So Lord, speak to us and give us a deeper love for Jesus this morning. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, amen. All right, you may all be seated. As we're in Acts chapter 7, um, let's just consider uh, some of the context of what's going on real briefly. Um, We see in Acts chapter 6 that in the beginning of this, that the apostles, the leaders of the early church, that they're gathered and a problem is presented to them. You see, the the church had this, the early church had this benevolence program um, for for those who were widows. This was carried uh, over from some Jewish practices in the synagogue that the people in the synagogue would come together, they would put their food together, their resources together, and they would serve the widows and those who were less fortunate um, because this is the heart of God. And the early church, they took this practice on and they continued to do it, um, dispersing food to uh, widows in need. And with the growing uh, church, I mean, the church just it was growing super quick. Lots of people coming to Jesus, meeting him for the first time. Um, it was just humongous. It was brought to their attention that although the Hebrew widows were being very well taken care of, the Hellenist widows were uh, somewhat being neglected. And uh, whether this means they didn't have uh, enough food or, or their, you know, their food was cold or whatever it might have been, uh, there was some sort of neglect going on and they weren't getting what they needed. So they come and they bring it to the apostles and, and then the apostles, they recognize that their calling is to focus on God's word and, and prayer, but nevertheless they want to meet this need because it's the heart of God to, to meet these sort of needs. So they raise up seven different guys that all have Greek names to, uh, to take care of these Greek widows. Um, because these guys, they would know their language, they would know their culture, they would be able, to, uh, be able to minister to them in the way that they needed. So one of these guys that we meet is a guy named Stephen. When we get to verse 8 in chapter 6, we see that Stephen, um, although he starts off as kind of a busboy serving food to the widows, 
that all of a sudden he's doing these wonders and signs and he's doing these great miracles. And it's really cool because this is the first time in the book of Acts that we see someone who's not an apostle uh, doing miracles and and wonders, which is really encouraging to me because it's like God can use just a normal person. Um, You know, when you see like Peter doing this awesome stuff, it's like, well, you're an apostle, you know, but here's just this normal guy. He's faithful. He's showing up every week. He's just loving on these, these widows that culture has kind of forgotten about. And God raises them up and starts to use them. So what happens is um, these, uh, this group uh, from the synagogue of the freedmen show up. And they start to uh, question Stephen and what he's doing. And uh, th- they think at first, okay, you know, here's some busboy. And, uh, you know, we're going to be able to school him. And, uh, you know, ask him some questions and catch him in his bad theology. And they can't do it. Uh, We're told there in Acts chapter 6 that they can't argue with his reasoning. And they also recognize the the, the power that's within him. The the Holy Spirit is within him. Since they can't argue with him and discredit him in that way, they do like what they did in the trial of Jesus and they hire people to be false witnesses. And these people start spreading all sorts of rumors about Stephen. So much so that, um, that we see the, the council shows up with the high priest, and they question him. And the high priest says in verse 1 of chapter 7, are these things so? And they brought all sorts of false accusations against him, like he's blaspheming God, blaspheming Moses, trying to change the traditions um, of Moses, and so forth. And, he, and then the high priest says, are these things so? And at this, uh, as we mentioned last week, uh, Stephen could have very easily just said no because they're lies. And perhaps uh, he wouldn't have ended up getting killed. Um, Spoiler alert, what happens at the end of the chapter. Uh, But he decides to take this opportunity to stand up and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to these people. Because his goal wasn't just to get out of the conflict. His goal was that these people would meet Jesus. So he uses this as an opportunity to start to preach. And he preaches uh, what I think outside of the teaching of Jesus might be the best sermon uh, in the New Testament. And he starts off by going, uh, talking about Abraham. And the reason he's bringing up Abraham is not only an introduction into this history, but trying to say to these Jewish people, here's a guy who hears God speak and he responds in faith. Okay, And God is sending you Jews, Messiah, and you're not responding in faith, and you're rejecting him, and you're not seeing the work of God that he's doing. And as he begins to progress through that, he moves on to Joseph. And uh, we remember the, the story of Joseph that he's, uh, th- he's one of the younger of a bunch of brothers. God gives him a dream that he's supposed to rule uh, over his brothers and be their deliverer. He tells them about it. They're not too psyched about this idea of little brother being the king and ruler that they're going to bow down to. Uh, so they do what guys do and they throw him in a pit. And then they sell him into slavery thinking that that will take care of the issue. And then we see that Joseph becomes second in command in Egypt, and during a famine, he ends up ruling over his brothers and delivering them, giving them food uh, to provide for them in this famine. And Stephen's saying all of this because Jesus is the same way. He's saying, look, God's sending you Messiah to rule over you and to be your deliverer and savior. You're rejecting him, okay? But he's still your Lord. He still is supposed to be the one who rules over you and delivers you. So now what he's going to do is he's going to move on to start to talk about Moses. Okay, and it's important from an interpretational standpoint that we ask, why is he even bringing up Moses? Okay, because in, uh, one of the reasons is that in chapter 6 at verse 11, they accuse him of blaspheming Moses. Okay, they're saying you're anti-Moses, which is like, like one of the greatest heresies that you could ever have as a Jew. You know, don't talk bad about Moses. Like, he's, he's the dude, you know? It's like bashing Billy Graham in a church. Like, you don't do that, you know? Um, and so Moses, he's the dude, and, uh, and, and he's saying, you're blaspheming him. So he's going to start to explain, no, I'm not blaspheming Moses. I'm actually going to show you why Moses was pointing to Christ and why he was saying that Christ, uh, that Jesus Christ was going to be the one that would come to save. And then in verse 14, they accuse him of trying to abolish the customs of Moses or the law. 
And Stephen is, is telling this to try to establish and explain to them that Jesus did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. So that's kind of the reasoning to why he's going to start to talk about Moses. And, and Moses, we're going to see, is a type of Christ, that there's a lot of similarities uh, in the life of Moses that point ultimately to Jesus Christ, because Jesus is the greater than Moses. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is that Jesus came. Jesus came. Let's read verse 17. But when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose who did not know Joseph. This man dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies so that they might not live. So the first thing we see here is that God's sovereign plan of redemption is revealed in Christ's coming. So in the situation in which they find themselves in, uh, we see that Joseph, right, he brings his, his brothers into uh, the land of Egypt, and um, there they are in a place of honor because Joseph is second in command in Egypt. And we're told that after a series of years pass and and kings die and new kings uh, take over, there arises a king, a pharaoh, who doesn't know Joseph. He doesn't uh, remember Joseph. And we're told in the book of Exodus that um, the Jewish people have actually started to grow to be so great um, that, that the pharaoh is actually kind of getting a little intimidated uh, by this group of people. They're, they're not Egyptians. They're maintaining their cultural and religious identity. And he's saying, we're going to have a real issue here um, if these guys try to cause some sort of a problem. They, they turn them into slaves, and they create this law that they're supposed to uh, kill any of the baby boys that, that these uh, Jewish people have, that these children of Israel have. So they, they give this, the Pharaoh gives this command to the midwives and tells them, you know, if, if, if it's a boy, uh, when it's born, uh, kill, the, kill the baby boy. It's brutal. It's absolutely brutal. And we're told that these midwives, that they fear God in the book of Exodus in chapter 1, so they don't do that. And they're like, we're, they fear God more than they fear the Pharaoh, so they spare the lives of these kids, and, and tons of these uh, children of Israel, they're, they're hiding these babies, and uh, we're going to see that Moses comes into this equation. But this is what's, what's going on. This is, this is kind of the stage of what's going on. They are being oppressed, absolutely oppressed. But this is revealing um, the, the plan of salvation that God has for these people. And in the same way, um, we find that, that we're also in a, a horrible situation and that all of us have sinned against a holy God. Um, we have all transgressed, we have, we have all um, broken God's law, God doesn't look at us, he doesn't grade on a curve, and he doesn't say you're not as bad as your uh, weird neighbor down the street, so we're going to you know, give you a deal so you can get in. No, compared to God, we are sinners, all of us, including me. We're all sinners, and this is our issue. But, but God comes into this, and, and unlike other deities from other religions that look down and say, you've got to figure it out and then you can get up here, God comes into it, sends his son, Jesus Christ, and the, the plan of redemption is revealed in this, okay? And um, the situation that they found themselves in was, was, was very bad. It was very difficult, and likewise, some of us find ourselves in various situations in this life that are very difficult. But the question has to be asked, would these people even want to get out of Egypt if it had not been bad? We're going to find out later in the passage that even though they were slaves that had to work every day and were taken advantage of, when they're delivered out of Egypt, they still miss it. They still want to go back. There was this draw, this fleshly draw for them to Egypt. And, and, and God needed them to realize that this was not his best for them. And sometimes God allows very difficult things in our lives because it leads us to him. My prayer life would not be half as good as it is if my life was always easy. When my life's easy, I, I, I just pray before meals. Thank you, Lord, for this burrito, you know? And that's my prayer life. But then the challenges show up. All of a sudden, oh, Lord in heaven, almighty. Sorry to say all these big words. I don't know what they mean, you know? 
Because God uses those things to bring us closer to him. And these children of Israel might have asked, why? Why am I a slave? Why am I going through this horrible tyranny and oppression? Because God wanted to deliver them. And then there's also the, the problem of, of free will, that people are sinners. But God comes into it, and God desires to deliver them out of it. The second thing that we see is that the life of Christ was pleasing to the Father. Verse 20, at this time Moses was born and was well-pleasing to God, and he was brought up in his father's house for three months. So we meet Moses. He, he's born, um, and being a, a male uh, baby, the law is, is that he's supposed to get killed. And, uh, and God looks upon this, this, this little boy, and God is pleased um, with this boy. And, and in that same way, um, we're told that God the Father was pleased with Jesus. In Matthew three seventeen. it says, And suddenly a voice came from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. That, you know, Jesus, when he died on the cross for us, it, it was a substitute for our sins. But the reason that Jesus' sacrifice was accepted by the Father is because he lived a holy life. Jesus fulfilled the law. Jesus never sinned. And because he lived a perfect life, that life can be accounted to our life when we place our faith in him. You see, Jesus, he never sinned. And because of that, the righteousness can be accounted to us. The next thing that we see is that Christ dwelt among us. Uh, he's called Emmanuel in the scriptures, which means God with us. Verse 21 but when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. So, so what we see here is, uh, is that um, Moses, when he becomes three months old, his parents, you know, they can't hide him anymore. Um, you know, maybe it was his cry or whatever it was. Um, they're afraid that they're going to be found out. So uh, they go ahead and they put him in a little basket in, in the river. That's what it means when it says exposing. And by God's providence, uh, one, one of the daughters of the Pharaoh finds this baby Moses. And she falls absolutely in love uh, like a little girl seeing a puppy. Daddy, can I, can I keep him? You know, and, and he can't say no because, you know, she's, she's, she's got the keys to his heart. And she takes care of this baby and in God's providence hires Moses' mom to raise Moses. It's so funny how God's working in all this. Oh, yeah, sure, I'll take a job. She gets paid to raise her own kid. It's really cool. Um, and... Uh, and, and, and what happens is, is uh, that as he starts to grow up, it says that he becomes well-versed in, in uh, the culture of the Egyptians, that he learns uh, at their schools, that he understands their customs, he understands their language, um, he, you know, he probably even wears their clothes. But at the same time, he maintains his identity as a children of Israel, okay? That, that, that never changes. He becomes immersed in the culture. And this is the same thing that Jesus did for us in the incarnation. Um, Jesus became flesh. God became a man. And he came and he, and he dwelt among us. We're also told uh, about Jesus that in Luke chapter 2 at verse uh, 52, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. That, that Jesus, it, it says... That, that he learned, that he grew up, that he became a, a respected um, young man in his community. Um, we're also told in Philippians 2, verses 5 through 7, Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Now, in this text, the... the the context of what Paul's talking about is humility. And he's saying, if you want to talk about humility, you need to look to the greatest example of humility ever, Jesus Christ. That Jesus, he, he became a man. And, and like I said earlier, different than, than what other religions say about some high and mighty deity expecting the people to figure it out before they can earn his love, Jesus, he came. 
and he became one of us. And he humbled himself. I mean, when you think about the, the coming of Jesus, it's, it's, it's amazing. He could have picked some, like, rich, well-to-do family, enjoying all the delicacies of, of the world at the time, right? Sleeping in, in some nice bed, having all the cable channels. You know, they didn't have cable. But, you know, and he chooses not to do this. He's born to this, this poor uh, young family, this engaged couple, Lots of people thought Mary was maybe 15, 16, 17 years old. And her story was that she had become pregnant by the Holy Spirit, which we know is true, but probably not that many people bought it. Sure, Mary. You just were praying and got pregnant. Of course. So Jesus was no doubt looked down upon that, that in this day and age, to have a children out, a, a child out of wedlock was like, you were shunned by society. And that's probably the reputation most people had of Jesus. We're also told that he grows up in this, this city called Nazareth. And at one point in Jesus' ministry, uh, you may remember that as he's teaching, someone says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? It was kind of this like ho-dunk, hick town uh, that nobody ever wanted to go to. You know, it's like Bakersfield, you know? <laughs> God bless you if you're from Bakersfield. I, God bless you. I'm sorry, you can email me. Um, but, you know, it's like, if you had to choose a town to grow up in, why'd you choose that one? It's this humility. We're told also in the book of John that at one point during his ministry, his brothers thought he was totally wacko. They come to pick him up uh, in, in, in the middle of, of him doing ministry. They're like, Jesus, we've come to get you. We're going to check you into a very nice institution, summer camp, and they're going to help you to figure out that you're not God, okay? Um, they thought he was totally nuts. And, and uh, interestingly enough, when they see Jesus rise from the dead, one of his brothers, James, are told, becomes a pastor, <laughs> which is really cool. But, but he's rejected by his family. Um, the people in his community, they, they don't believe in him, which is why Jesus says the prophet's never accepted in his own town. And as he shows up to meet the religious leaders of the day, these are the pastors and, and bishops and elders, all the guys that would, they taught the Bible, they had memorized the Bible, and he shows up, and they just, they just don't want anything to do with him. They think he's nuts. They think he's a total heretic. And they reject him and ultimately crucify him. And this is what Jesus did for you. And this is what Jesus did for me. He came into our world. He became immersed in our world. And, God, and, and Jesus is fully God. He's also fully man. And, and he dealt with, with this rejection we're also told uh, in the book of Hebrews 4, 15 through 16, one of my favorite scriptures, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy to find grace to help in a time of need. What we're told there that Jesus in his incarnation that he was tempted in all ways as we are, yet without sin. Do you realize that? That Jesus experienced temptation. So that when you and I are dealing with temptation, when you and I uh, are, are feeling depressed or discouraged, that Jesus has been there. And he knows what we're going through, so much so that the logic of the author of Hebrews here is that he is a sympathetic high priest. When you and I fail, he doesn't look at us and say, oh gosh, would you just get it together? Why can't you be perfect like me? That's not Jesus' heart for us. He's sympathetic. He knows what we're going through. So much so that the author of Hebrew goes on to say there in that last verse that we can, we can come to God boldly when we need grace in a time of need. Because Jesus knows what we're going through. It's, that's all part of, of the doctrine of his incarnation. It's what it means practically for us in our lives. 
And Moses is a picture of that. The next thing that we are going to see in verses 23 and 24 is that Christ came to defend us. Verse 23, now when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. So when Moses turns 40, he decides that he wants to go and visit uh, his brethren. He wants to go and see the children of Israel. And uh, when, when he shows up, one of the first things that he sees is this Egyptian totally taking advantage uh, of a Hebrew. So uh, we're told back in the book of Exodus that what he does is he goes over to this Egyptian. He looks to the left. He looks, uh, I, I'm, I got it mixed up. He looks to the left, looks to the right, and uh, he doesn't see anyone. And then he just, he just takes this guy out. He kills him. And uh, because it was a part of his very DNA that he was to be a deliverer. It was his calling. Uh, it maybe wasn't the best way to walk in his calling at the time. Uh, some commentators had said that the problem with Moses is that he didn't also look up to see if that's what God wanted him to do. But nevertheless, this is what he does because he has the heart of a defender. And Jesus also is a defender that we are oppressed by sin and Satan, and he came to die on the cross to break the power of sin and Satan. And, and, and he rose again on the three day in victory over those things. Jesus came to defend us. He came to deliver us. We're told in the book of Philippians 2, 8, and being, in, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. That, that Jesus... He, he was obedient to God, and he died on that cross for us, and, and so much so that we're told um, that when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's praying, and, and it says that he's, he's sweating drops of blood, which physicians say is, is a sign of extreme anxiety and stress. And one of the things that he prays is, is Father, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. It was a struggle in Jesus, in his humanity. Yet he does it for us, and he did it for you. To be the sacrifice, to be your deliverer, that if you trust in Jesus Christ, that, that God will consider you righteous, that you will be saved. That, that is how you get right with God. It's not by keeping some list of rules and being a, a good little boy or a good little girl. It's about trusting in Jesus Christ that we are forgiven by God when we do that. That's how we can be restored, and that's what he did for us. We can reflect on that this week as we consider what he did for us on the cross. Next, Christ was rejected by his people when he came. Verse 25, for he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. And the next day he appeared to two of them as they were fighting and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you wrong one another? But he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Then at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian, where he had two sons. So we see that, that Moses goes uh, the next day, and he sees a couple uh, of these Jews fighting with one another. And he goes to try and reconcile them. And uh, it says there in verse 25 that, that he assumed that they would have known uh, that their time of deliver, deliverance had come. We'll unpack that uh, at, towards the end of the sermon, what, what he means by that. But then he shows up and uh, tries to reconcile them. And they're like, who made you the, the ruler over us and the deliverer of us? You know, what, you're just going to kill me like you killed that Egyptian the other day. And Moses is thinking, oh, dang, somebody knows about that. He thought he got away with it. He thought that nobody noticed. And, and you know, the same happens with us sometimes. We think, oh, my sin, it's just my thing. It affects other people. And, and, and if nothing else, if no one else sees our sin, God sees it. And, and Moses, although he was trying to do a righteous thing, he was doing it in an unrighteous way, what, is what I think. And, and at hearing this, that they had realized, he just flees and he takes off 
to Midian, and he starts a family, has a couple of kids, he becomes a shepherd, and this passion that he had within him to save and deliver his people, he probably just starts to assume, you know, I was a little overpassionate, I was a little overexcited, maybe that's not what God is calling me to do, I'm just going to take care of these sheep, I'm just going to live my life, and, uh, you know, I-, I guess that wasn't what I was supposed to do. And, and I felt compelled as I was studying this to, um, to share and encourage. I feel like there might be people here this morning that that's you. You maybe tried to start walking in your calling and it didn't work out. Or maybe uh, you, f- you fell into a, a season of sin or rebellion uh, or, or whatever it may be. And you feel like, you know what, God is just done with me. That was what uh, he called me to do when I was younger. But you know what, I, I messed it all up and he just must be done with me. And I'm here to tell you this morning that God is never done with you. And that, that those things that God put on your heart, he did that for a reason. And you know, since God lives outside of time, you know, we hear God speak to us and we think, great, this is happening on Thursday. God doesn't work like that. Sometimes he reveals something to us and then it's years and years and years later. Moses doesn't start his ministry till he's 80. And look how God used him. Don't ever believe the lie, by the way, that you're too old to start being used by the Lord. If he could start start at 80, can you imagine what God will do through you? Don't ever ever say that, that God can't use you because I've messed things up too much. I walked away from my calling. I'm too old. I'm too this. Don't limit God. God does awesome things to Moses. And what we see here is that in this first coming, so to speak, of Moses, that the people reject him, that his people reject him. And Stephen's telling this because in this same way, God has sent Jesus, Messiah, to them, and they have rejected him. And he's saying, look, guys, just because you rejected him doesn't mean that he's not still Lord and Savior. Because your forefathers rejected Moses when he came. He's like, he's bringing a full circle. You want to talk about blaspheming Moses? <laughs> You're the one that rejected him. And then he ended up being your deliverer and ruler. And he went down in history in that way. Don't make the same mistake and reject Christ, is what Stephen is saying. That's why he's telling this. And, and let me just say that if, if God is trying to work in your life or, he's, or you, you feel that he's, he's trying to, to save you and, and you're just saying no to Jesus, God is a gentleman and he will never force himself on anyone. He won't force you to become a Christian. If you push him away, he'll listen. The good news is that God doesn't give up very easily. I praise him for that, because if he went away the first time I told him no, then even the 50th time, I mean, you know, he's so gracious. However, the scriptures do say that there can come a point when we keep rejecting, keep rejecting, keep rejecting, that God will say, okay, fine. Don't get to that spot with the Lord. This morning, even, submit your life to Jesus Christ. Trust in Jesus Christ. God loves you, and he wants to save you. And, and even though these Jews had rejected their Messiah, God was still not done with them. And he's still not done with the Jewish people. He's still patient. And the book of Zechariah tells us that there's coming a day when, when the Jewish people are going to recognize that Jesus is Messiah. They're going to look on him who they pierced. And they're going to realize. So moving on, uh, talking about how Jesus saves In verse 30. And when 40 years had passed, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight, and as he drew near to observe, the voice of the Lord came to him, saying, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and dared not look. Then the Lord said to him, Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. 
which is my verse for why it's good to be barefoot sometimes. Uh, Verse 34, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and, and have come down to deliver them. And now come, I send you to Egypt. I, I love this. So here's Moses. He's 80 years old. He's thinking, man, my life was a waste. I tried to start my ministry by killing someone, which was a bad idea. And now I've just been out here taking care of these sheep. And God appears in this burning bush and speaks to him. It says, Moses, I want to use you. I want to take you to Egypt, and you're going to deliver my people out of Egypt And I love what he says there in that last verse that we read. I have heard their cries. Do you know that God hears your cries? These people, they're they're, they're just living day in and day out. Like, for them, there is no future. They can't even imagine having a day off. This is their reality. Day in and day out. And they're crying out to God. And they can't help but think, is anyone even up there? Yet God hears and God cares. And he might not always work according to our schedule, but God does hear our cry. And God is so good to deliver. And we see the heart of God the Father here. That even though these people are so rebellious, and even when they get delivered, we're going to see that they even start worshiping a golden statue, and God knows about that because he's all-knowing, he still loves them, and he still wants to deliver them, and he still wants to hear their cry and answer their prayer. And we see that heart revealed in Jesus Christ. Because although we sin, and we've separated ourselves from God. God has every right to judge every single one of us. You have to swallow that truth before you can experience the riches of the gospel. Because God is perfect and he's holy and he's just. And just like we don't want to see someone who does a horrendous crime get off, God is just in that same way but it is his heart to restore us to him. So he sends his son, Jesus Christ, and we see the heart of the Father manifest in Jesus coming to save us. That Jesus wants to reconcile you to God. If you're willing, if you will trust, if you will place your faith. And the next thing that we see is that Jesus is our ruler and redeemer. Verse 35 This Moses whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? Is the one God sent to be a ruler and deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. Okay, so Stephen just real quickly uh, kind of summarizes um, what, what happens? That Moses goes in, he starts doing these wonders and signs, and he delivers them uh, out of Egypt, and they're in the wilderness there for 40 years. And what we see there also is that um, Moses, he's the one that, that his brethren, when they saw him the first time, they said, who made you our, our ruler and, and deliverer, right? In, in other words, why do you think that you're the one who, who's going to rule over us, be our king, and the one who's going to deliver and save us out of our calamities. And, and Stephen says, well, God, then God raises him up to do exactly that. Because that was his calling. And in the same way, we're told in the New Testament that Jesus is not only to be our Savior and our Deliverer, but also our Lord and Ruler. You see, we tend to do really well with the first one. We want Jesus to be our Savior. Come and help me and make it so I don't have to to go to hell. He's like an insurance policy. But then our Lord, ooh, but I'm my own man. We struggle with that. 
We want Jesus to be like this little compartment of our life so that he can free us so that we can do whatever we want. Yet this is not really true happiness because the only time that we'll actually be content is when we're submitted to Jesus as Lord. When, when, when we realize that everything in our life, it's not even ours, it's a gift, it's actually God's and we're just a steward of it. And when, when we realize that, that God, you're not just this little compartment of my life, but everything is yours, our life totally starts to change. Because what we have, our income, our savings account, our spouse, our whatever, our kids, it's not ours, it's God's. He's entrusted these things to us. So, so for us to take these things that he's given us, he's just lending them to us, and then for us to say, my precious, you know, and just say, this is all my stuff, that's so, it's so silly. Like, 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 what if I, you know, like, loaned you, like, my car for the week, and then you started driving around Camarillo, and you tell everyone, this is my car. It's mine. Don't touch it. You can't borrow it. It's like, no, it's not your car. You're just borrowing it. That's our, everything in our life. We're just borrowing it. So he becomes Lord over everything. He becomes Lord over our marriage. He becomes Lord over our finances. And when we're in that place of humility to him, we really start to experience life. Because then we don't have to hold it all together. We put too much pressure on ourselves. We think that it's all up to us to keep this train rolling. It's not. It's up to God. So when we see him as Lord, Lord, it's, it's all yours. I'm just, I'm just here along for the ride. I just want to be faithful with what you've given to me. This is what Jesus means when he says in Matthew 10, 39, he who seeks to find his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. That when we go around, we're trying to cr create this like sort of paradise on earth where we want this Pinterest life where everything's perfect. And then we're not happy, Right? Because you can't make it perfect. But when we just say, Lord, this is, it's all yours. I'm just, I'm giving it up for you. Then we can finally start to actually enjoy our lives. Because we're not trying to be in control of everything. When we lose our life for his sake, that's when we truly find our life. That's when we truly find joy. Because we're not meant to be the king of our lives. Jesus is meant to be the king of our lives. So finally we see that Jesus fulfills Verse 37, this is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren, him you shall hear. Okay, so, um, so what he's saying here is he's referring to the, the Pentateuch, which means the book in five parts, is that one of the things that Moses says, I believe it's in the uh, book of Deuteronomy, is he speaks of a prophet um, who is going to be greater than him that they need to listen to. And Stephen's bringing this, this verse out, and he's saying he's talking about Jesus here. Mo he goes, you want to talk about bashing Moses, about throwing Moses under the bus? He said there's a prophet coming, and you better listen to him. And he came, and you didn't listen to him. That's why Stephen is saying all of this. And, and this is sort of even an echo um, back of, of verse 25 in Acts chapter 7, I'll read it to you again real quick. For he, Moses, supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. So here's the question. Why did Moses suppose that his brethren would understand that he had come to be their deliverer? Did he have some sort of like cool Egyptian tattoo that said deliverer? You know, I mean, how would they have known? It's because... God had told Abraham, your descendants will be in Egypt for 400 years, and then I will deliver them out. It had been 400 years. So Moses shows up, and he's like, everyone should realize, because 400 years have been up. But they didn't really take God at his word. They, they, they didn't realize 
that, that Moses was the promised one that was going to come and deliver them. And, and this reminds me of, of what we see in Luke chapter 19 at verse 42. Jesus says, and this is actually on Palm Sunday, which is today, when Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey, he says these words after. If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. So here, and, and, and the point here is that Jesus fulfills prophecy. Why did Jesus say this to Jerusalem? He comes in on the donkey. You should have known that this was the day. How would they have known? You see, there's this prophecy in Daniel chapter 9. And God speaks to Daniel and says that from the rebuilding of the wall, there's going to be 49 weeks or 49 sets of years, sets of seven years, rather, and that after this time, Messiah will show up, okay? So if you consider King Artaxerxes commands Nehemiah to go rebuild the wall, March 14th, 445 B.C., if you take out your calendar and you plug in the numbers according to a Jewish calendar, which is 360 days, it brings you to April 6th, AD 32, which is the day that Jesus is riding in on a donkey. So why does Jesus say you should have known? Because you should have known. If you would have read your Bible, you would have known that this is the day for Messiah. This is the day that Messiah is showing up. And Jesus fulfills that prophecy. Jesus fulfills this prophecy from Moses. There are so many prophecies about Messiah, and Jesus fulfills every single one of them. And that's what sets Christianity apart from any other religion. Because how can we know that this book is really from God? Well, God has to tell us something that only God knows, the future. And we know that Jesus is Messiah because he fulfills these prophecies that were given hundreds of years before Jesus even comes on the scene. And we even still have documents that are dating back to before Jesus came saying these things. So it's not like as, as some liberal theologians used to speculate, well, maybe someone just got a piece of paper 400 years later and wrote prophecies. No, they date back to hundreds of years before Jesus even shows up. It's because Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is Messiah. Jesus fulfills prophecy. Next we see that Jesus fulfills the law, the demands of the law. Verse 38. This is he who is in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us. Now, now he's, he's talking about this because you remember one of the accusations that these Jews are bringing against Stephen is that he's trying to get rid of the customs of Moses. That Jesus is trying to get rid of the customs of Moses. Okay? And, and Jesus did not come to abolish the law. Jesus said, um, on the contrary, in Matthew 5, verse 17, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill you see, what Jesus does, so, some Christians sometimes think that, oh, now that we have the New Testament, just go ahead and tear off the Old Testament and just throw it in the trash because it's all about the new, man. No, he didn't come to get rid of the old. He came to fulfill the old. And Jesus fulfilled the law because he lived a perfect life. So why did God even give us the law? The Apostle Paul talks about this in Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. In other words, as we consider the law, if you even consider the Ten Commandments, nobody can honestly say that, that you've, you've obeyed all Ten Commandments, right? We, we've all sinned. We've all failed. So why would God give us this list that we could never even obey, Want to laugh at us? No, that's not why. It's because the law is supposed to be a, a tutor, Paul says, that brings us to Christ. Okay? In other words, it's, it's like in Romans chapter 7. You remember Paul is going through this great internal struggle. He says, I don't do the things that I want to do, 
and I do the things that I don't want to do. Like, he's like, I know the law is a good thing. I want to do the things that the law says to do, but I don't do it. I fail because I'm a sinner. And then he says, oh, wretched man that I am, who will save this wretched body of death? And he goes on to say at the end of Romans chapter 7, thank God through Jesus Christ. Because the law, it reveals to us that we're sinners. That we can't, we don't even stand close to comparing to an all holy, all perfect God. But it leads us to realize that like the Jewish people in Egypt, I'm going to be stuck here forever if it's only up to me. I need a deliverer. I need a ruler. Which is why God sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to live the perfect life that you and I could never live and die the death that we should have died in our place for our sins, rising three days later in victory over sin, Satan, and death. And that if we trust in Jesus Christ, that we are saved, that we are forgiven, that Jesus fulfills the demands of the law, And no longer is it about us trying to be some sort of a perfect person. But Jesus has done it for us. And no longer are we living a life of religion where we're trying to obey God so that he will love us. But that because he loves us, then we want to obey him. He gives us a new heart and he changes us and he makes us into a new creation. And the last thing that we see here is that Jesus fulfills our deepest longings. Verse 39 whom our fathers would not obey but rejected, and in their hearts they turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. As for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. Did you offer my slaughtered animals and sacrifices during the 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You also took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Remphan, images which you made to worship, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. So what he says there is is he uh, retells the story that um, when Moses is on Sinai uh, for 40 days, that the, the children of Israel, they start to think, this guy, Moses, he's not coming back. And they come up with this kind of a peculiar idea. They say, I know. Let's all gather our jewelry and make a gold statue of a cow and worship it. You know, and, and it's like, it's, you, you read it and it's like, what? It's like, you know, if Pastor Bruce was gone for a month and a half, you know, we would make some golden statue and put it on the stage. Like, what, what are they thinking? Yet we mount these screens on our walls and say, this is going to bring me contentment. We buy these large pieces of doctored up aluminum, put an engine in them, they go really fast, and we think this is going to make me happy. We think if we can raise up these perfect little children that completely obey us and get perfect grades and get rich, that we'll be happy. We think that, oh, if I can only be in a relationship, then I'd be happy. Then 10 years later, we get bored of that person, we trade them in like a used car, thinking this will make me happy, a new person. And we run through our lives with this sort of idolatry. We might not make a golden statue, but we look to all sorts of things and people to bring us what only God can give us in that place of worship and adoration and surrender and bowing down to. This is what Paul means when he talks about in the book of Romans 1, verses 22 through 23. He says, professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. You see, the great problem of humanity, what we've done, is we've taken God, the position that he needs to be in, creator God, we've taken him down, and we worship creation. 
We think that a relationship's going to make us happy. We think that an, a sum of money uh, is going to make us happy. And, and Martin Luther, as he was observing uh, the Ten Commandments, had a very uh, insightful statement. He said, if we could just keep the first two commandments, we wouldn't break the rest of them. Because if we didn't have an idolatry problem, then that's what sin comes out of, is that we mess it up and we look to all these things and people to bring us happiness. We think that if we have these things, then we'll be content. But the biblical way, what the gospel teaches us we can do, is instead of worshiping creation, we can put God there, we worship God as creator, and then we just get to enjoy creation. This might be the problem in your marriage. You're looking to your spouse to be Jesus. He ain't. (laughs) Only Jesus is perfect. And when you put Jesus back in that spot, then you just get to enjoy your marriage. Because you know they're just another sinner saved by grace, just like you. And we get to enjoy our lives finally when we're not worshiping things and people and we're worshiping God and enjoying things and people. And, and we see that, that these people, these children of Israel, that they ran to this. And you know what? Jesus Christ, he frees us from our, our idolatry because he fulfills the deep longings of our heart. This is why we covet. Because you put some idol in your heart, it's not enough. You need more. You need a bigger boat, a bigger house, another spouse, because you want more, because that idol's not f- filling the spot that only God can. But when we put Jesus in that spot, he fulfills those deep longings of our heart. So this morning, where are you at? Have you surrendered to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If you put your faith in Jesus, the Bible says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. It's not a list of good works that you do that earns God's love. Jesus did it all. He paid it all. He fulfilled the demands of the law and he will fulfill your heart. Surrender to him this morning. Let's pray and then let's worship our Lord. Holy God, we thank you for this time that we can spend with you. We thank you for speaking to us, God. We pray that you would just help us to um, just meditate on these truths and that we would experience life, Lord. Help us to reprioritize our eyes and our hearts, Lord. Reveal to us the things that we've turned into idols. And Lord, we, we want to repent of that this morning. We want to give it to you. Lord, we we pray that you would forgive us when we only want you to be our Savior but not our Lord, and we want to control our lives, and we think it's all on us. Lord, we thank you that when we surrender to you that we're relieved of an incredible burden because we just get to rest in you, Lord. And Father, I, I I just pray that right now as we worship you that this would be a refreshing time that we could connect with you, Father. And we love you and pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.